everyone. My name is Sarah Sieper and I'm the Knowledge Management and Strategic Communications Senior Associate on the Momentum Integrated Health Resilience Project funded by USAID. For the fourth episode of this series, we're going to focus on community health. Um, the World Health Organization defines community health as the environmental, social, and economic resources needed to sustain emotional and physical well-being among people in ways to advance their aspirations and to satisfy their needs in their unique environment. Today, we have Eric Ramirez Ferrero, Senior Technical Director on Momentum, to discuss some of the ways the project is working to strengthen community health approaches in fragile settings and why working at the community level is so important, particularly where we work. Welcome, Eric. Can you go ahead and introduce yourself, specifically a little bit about your background and your role on Momentum? Hi, Sarah. Um, thanks for having me. Um, um, my name is Eric Ramirez Ferrero. I'm the Senior Technical Director, as um, Sarah mentioned, of the MIHR project. Um, I began my international career as a University of Michigan Population Fellow working in Tanzania. And at that point, I was assigned um, to work in a social and behavioral change um, project focused on HIV. It was the time when, you know, PEPFAR was just beginning. Um, so that project had a huge community component. Um, and, and so have all of the other projects, actually, I've, I've always worked on, um, including most recently as chief of party of the Maternal and um, Child Survival Program in Mozambique and then as um, technical director of the Evidence to Action project, which was USAID's global flagship family planning project. And I just, well, not just, I just joined, I just joined uh, MIHR in 2021. Thanks so much, Eric, and welcome. Um, can you first describe how you would define community health and why it's so important um, in fragile settings? And if you could just provide a little bit of background on how Momentum um, approaches our community health work, that would be great. Yeah, you know, it's really funny because when you think of community health, um, um, it's it's something that WHO has had a funny relationship with in a way. Um, you know, when you think of the six building blocks that make up how you, you know, WHO defines um, a health system, you know, community is not included. And it's just been sort of integrated into the different components um, in different ways. Um, but, you know, we really think that um, community health is vital uh, for the um, especially in fragile settings, as you mentioned, because when you look um, at the quality of care that's often provided um, by facilities um, in these very difficult and um, challenging settings, you know, sometimes quality and respectful care simply isn't um, possible um, to provide when you may not have a provider, the logistics may not be there, you know, and for those reasons, what we try to do is lower the burden on those facilities and shift what we can um, to community settings so that we can provide care, you know, at the at the lowest levels possible, so people can access um, those services. And it really does go back to our, um, you know, this commitment to community health goes back to our public health roots, um, you know, that it really recognizes that communities are the place where health is both generated and maintained at equal or greater, um, you know, to an equal or greater degree than, than health facilities. So that's why um, community health is so important to us. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of the five community health themes that um, our project leverages in our work? If I can remember them all, yes, I will try to, um, let you know what those are and why they're important to us. Um, so definitely improving community participation is one. And it's a really critical one for us. It, it goes well um, and in alignment with USAID's localization approach. Um, when we really are talking about community participation, we're talking about inclusive and participatory development, which is really bringing people to the table, sometimes disparate groups of people, sometimes groups that are even in conflict with one another, um, to discuss what the priorities are for their communities, um, to think about ways that they can address those health priorities and ways that they can um, you know, do it together. 
So when we think of, you know, the various settings in which we work, sometimes, like I said, they may be conflict-ridden settings, that building trust um, is an essential part of that. Building trust between groups and also building trust between, um, you know, the civil society participants and the state, in our case, often represented by um, health, health services. So that's the first one. Now, the second one, um, community health governance. Um, you know, that has to do with how functional, um, you know, sort of government at the local level is, the community structures that are in place that can enable um, something like community health to really take place. Um, oftentimes, you know, we can't change an entire system, but we'll, what we really can do is help, for instance, to look at standards of performance for district health officials. You know, what are things that we can sort of build capacity on that helps them meet, you know, those standards in terms of how you assess your community, how you implement a project, how you manage it, how you evaluate it, and, and seeing what the results are. So, so that's in short kind of how we can work with um, community health governance. In terms of um, the next one is, you know, self-care and quality of care. We think this is central to the way we work, which we really try to be client-centered. We try to bring as many resources to people as possible. And in some cases, what we try to do is, um, you know, bring resources and make people aware of resources where they don't have to access health services, where maybe they can go directly to a drug shop and get a contraceptive that they may need or, you know, um, a dehydration uh, or a hydration, um, you know, solution, oral hydration therapy or, you know, whatever it is so that they can be empowered um, to take those health actions on their own. And we try to promote that. Um, the next one is, you know, familiar to everyone is social and gender norms and how those, you know, affect behavior change. And we know that those are intimately affected with the way, why and the way that people use, use health services. And, you know, just to give you an example, we know that family planning use um, is deeply affected by gender relations um, to the, you know, um, who makes decisions about health care, um, you know, too many times it's still unfortunately the man alone that may make um, decisions. So we really tried to promote, you know, um, gender equity, shared decision making, um, so people can make healthy choices um, about their own lives and also the lives of their um, families. And then finally, it's resource allocation. One of the things that we find with community health, and we were just talking about it this morning, how it may be important for a Ministry of Health to really um, expand that or promote that, but there may not always be the resources at hand. So how can we use sort of, you know, state funds that are available? How can we bring donors on board? How can we work with um, private NGO partners um, to really provide the resources that community health workers need in terms of salary, equipment, um, transportation, basic things like that that enable them to do their work. So, you know, when, when we take all of these things together, it really is a way for us to reinforce the resilience of a community um, so that when, you know, crises strike, um, they're better able to plan and have those essential things that they need um, to promote service continuity and continuity of care. Great, thank you so much for that. That was a really um, thorough overview of the work that we're doing and sort of the the main ways that our project is, you know, working to prioritize and implement community health. Um, so in many of our countries, community health systems often rely on both formal and informal providers to, you know, deliver information and provide health services at the community level. Why are both important for, um, you know, improving community health approaches? And can you talk a little bit about how their roles may differ? You know, I, again, I sort of come back to this fact that, um, you know, in fragile settings, we may have shortages of a lot of things, you know, that, that we have, but the thing that we don't have a shortage of is people and people who are willing to do things for their community. You know, so we do have the, um, 
you know, the formal um, community health um, providers, which, you know, usually includes community health members, uh, community health workers, or maybe people, you know, on assignment from their facility to go out and, you know, provide certain educational sessions um, and the like. But, you know, we also, through our project, um, you know, have, have what we call an active civil society component, you know, where we work with young people to become, you know, doers in their own communities, where we, um, you know, ask them to reach out to their peers with education and information, and, you know, forming special events to get young people interested, you know, in services and the like. You know, we work with um, NGOs, um, you know, to, to expand their work you know, in community health um, and the like. So at the end of the day, you know, their work may not be so completely different, except that, you know, one is officially sanctioned and supported by the Ministry of, of Health and, and other structures. Um, but, you know, there's lots of people in the community that are doing good work and that are enabling, um, you know, their peers um, and, um, yeah, neighbors um, to access care um, and the like. So all are really required. And, you know, even at the household level, you know, asking couples and families to adopt healthy practices in terms of, you know, frequent hand washing, you know, latrine use, um, you know, whatever the case may be to make the environment safe for their children um, and, and healthy for their, for their children. So really everyone has a role to play. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I know in some of the activities that we're doing, we use a lot of the, you know, model households and things like that, and really having um, community members exemplify healthy behaviors and hopefully, you know, have this trickle down effect of, um, you know, changing these behaviors among other people in their communities. Um, in your experience, what are some of the challenges, you know, faced by community health workers and also um, maybe these informal health workers as well? Um, and what are some of the ways that our project supports them and helps them, you know, overcome some of these common challenges? Yeah, sorry, that's a great question. And we just had a, um, a learning session today for a technical team on exactly some of these issues, some of the issues that we call, you know, that have to do with the functionality of a community health uh, worker system. So sometimes you find, you know, when you look across countries that, you know, health, community health workers may not be adequately trained. Um, in some places, the roles are not clear and there's sort of redundancy and and different partners that may be funding them, may be asking them to do, you know, sl slightly different things. Um, sometimes they, they may not have the tools they need. They may not have, you know, the paths that they need to collect the data that we're asking them to collect about services provided. They may, may not have transport, you know, to get to from one community, you know, to another. So I think, you know, part of the thing that we do is that we use the, um, the AIM tool, which is a tool that assesses, again, the functionality of a community health worker system, identifies those weaknesses, you know, that exist. And then we work together with government and our NGO partners to be able to fulfill, you know, to fill some of those gaps, you know, that, that, that we see. And in our case, because we work in fragile settings, you know, we've added a few modules um, to the AIM tool related specifically to risk communication, what to do as a community health um, worker when a crisis strikes, um, so that they can serve as a useful point of information, a, a point of referral, in some cases, a point of service, point of care, direct point of care. Um, so, um, yeah, so so that's that's what we do, and we're trying to get um, governments now to institutionalize, take on on board these tools, so that they can on their own sort of do these assessments and improve those things in the community health worker system that need help. Exactly, and sometimes they even uncover just like the simplest of things that um, you may not realize are so important. Um, when I went to our project sites in in Tanzania, one of the things that community health workers were saying was we just like want badges so that we can look more official exactly. when we're going to communities and just like have a little bit greater sense of authority. Um, and, you know, that's something that maybe is not um, thought of all the time. And that's something that for them would feel, make them feel like they could do their job a bit better having some sort of, um, you know, 
leadership identifying um, uniform or badge or thing like that. So sometimes these tools can uncover just things like that, that, you know, make a big difference for people in the community. Great. Yeah. Uh, um, can you also talk about a little um, more of the connection between strength and community health and um, improved health outcomes in areas where our project is working? You know, sure. There's um, you know, the reason why we use community health is that there's pretty extensive literature now, you know, linking um, community health workers um, activities um, together with increased access to services, um, increased equity of access to services. You know, one of the things that we don't often talk about is um, when you do have a very carefully planned um, community health worker plan to access your community. Let's say it's a house by house basis so that you make sure and reach every house in a district, um, you know, or or every house in a region, a district may be too big, um, but even those that are marginalized, um, you know, the literature shows that community health can be amazingly effective in, in making those in inequities of access disappear. You know, um, this has been shown especially true to be, um, you know, in, in HIV work, there's been a lot of um, work done showing that, um, but, but also in our fields of, you know, reproductive health care, family planning, um, and the like, um, it's, it's really mobilizing your services um, to, um, right, to make services more equitable. Sometimes it means that the community health worker brings these um, services right to the home. You know, sometimes it's self-testing, um, you know, promoting the self-care stuff. Um, so um, all of that, um, you know, leads to increased um, health outcomes. You know, I wish I had a specific example that I could use right now, but I, but I know that, you know, our work in community health that we're doing and what the AIM tool is showing is that we are having an impact and how effective the community health worker systems is where we work. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to end our interview with this question. So for global health professionals out there or those that are working in adjacent fields um, that are looking to also prioritize community health approaches in their work, where should they start? You know, websites to visit, resources yeah. to review, trainings, things of that nature. You know, it's a great question. And it takes me back to what I said early on is, um, you know, that in some ways community health work um, takes us back to our roots as, you know, as public health practitioners, that it really does, you know, um, it really is community-based, it really is working with people. And so looking at things like, um, you know, universal healthcare um, coverage, you know, documents, looking at primary healthcare, um, you know, um, documents that, you know, that were developed, looking at the SDGs in terms of you know, what they have in mind and the like. But there's also, you know, some specialist, um, you know, tools that, that we would recommend. We work closely, you know, with WHO and a lot of different things that we do, um, you know, but one of the documents that we use is the WHO guideline on health policy and systems to support, to optimize community health worker um, programs. Um, we, so just look, you know, at the, WHO site, um, um, and also, you know, there was a whole series that was done, I think it was in 221, um, by Health Research, um, um, Research Policy and Systems, you know, that had a series of, I think, 10 or 11 articles related to community health work. You know, so if you want one place where you can see what the major issues are, what some of the proposed major solutions are, um, you know, those that would be a good place to look. And I think the World Health um, Organization documents are good in terms of like standards and guidelines and, you know, things that should be followed, you know, when we do um, this kind of work. But but I think, you know, Sarah, that, that should get people started. And maybe, you know, as we publish, um, you know, this interview, maybe we can include some resources there as well. Yeah, thank you so much, um, you know, for your insight and for sharing your knowledge on why focusing on community health is essential for helping to strengthen resilience um, and improve health outcomes in our partner countries. Great.
Great. Thanks, Sarah.